Hi everyone, so this is a first ever DWTV feature, Talking with a Legend. I'm joined by uh, a West Humble legend, a man who's got many goals for Wanderers, uh, Gareth Chandler. How are you doing, Gareth? You right? Yeah, good, mate. Not too bad. How are you? Yes, not too well. I mean, every day feels like the weekend at the moment. Nothing's going on. So, I mean, apart from that, <laughs> it's all right. Um, no idea what day it is today, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's the first time feature we've done, first time we've ever done it. Um, so hopefully it's going to go quite smoothly. And so we do appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Um, we, we'll go straight into the first question. Um, you know, you, you're a uh, you're a Wanderers legend. I mean, I've only been at the club shortly, and, and the amount of times I've uh, heard your name in, in a positive manner, is, oh, I can't, can't, can't even count them up. So it's, uh, you definitely, uh, you know, made, made a mark when you were here at Wanderers. And let, let's go all the way back. You, you know, 2016, you, you signed for Dorking Wanderers. How did the move originally come about? Um, it was completely out of the blue, to be honest. Um, I was playing for Wharton and Hersham at the time. I'd just been relegated from step four. Um, and literally, I think it was the last week in April, maybe the first week in May. And I had Gary Pascoe, who was um, assistant manager at the time, just give me a call basically and ask what my plans for football were for the next year. And obviously, first week in May, I had absolutely no idea. But I said, all right. If a club like Dorking, who I think had lost in the playoffs the season before, were interested, it's definitely a conversation I'd, uh, I'd like to have. And maybe the day after that, Mark White gave me a ring. And by, I think, like the 2nd of May, I think it came up with my time hop last week, um, I'd, I'd signed. Martin had driven to my house in Kingston at the time with the paperwork. And, and yeah, it was done. It was it's got to be the earliest... Uh, transfer in non-league history, I think, getting your business done at the end of April. Yeah. And, and when you played the first game for the club, uh, I'm setting this scene here, you know, you, you, you've walked through the gates at West Ham Ball, you played your first match. At the end of that match, um, and I don't know what the result was, but <laughs> did you feel there was something special about that club at that time? Absolutely, yeah. Just even back then, it just felt like a real sort of community club um, with a group of people who had ambition to uh, go up through the leagues, but also hadn't forgotten where they'd come from. Um, it was a real sort of like family feel, everyone from like Mooney in the kitchen to uh, Sir Les on the tannoy. Um, everyone was just sort of in it together and it was just a really, really nice feel about the club, to be honest. It was really yeah. good. Yeah, and, and, and when you were playing, you know, what was it like playing under Mark White as a, you know, as a player? He was a good manager, to be fair. I think. Um, it's probably the same for most players that uh, that sign for Dorking. They think all oh, player, chairman, sorry, manager, chairman. Um, does he really know what he's talking about? Um, but I think fairly early on, uh, it became clear that he, there's a reason why Dorking been promoted 11 times in 20 years, whatever it is. Um, and he certainly knows what he's talking about. And I think his best quality of a manager was. Um, how honest he was with his players. Um, I feel like even players that weren't playing, players that were playing, everyone knew where they stood and, and nobody was living off um, sort of like fake and false promises that I guess you see a lot in, especially in non-league football. Um, but with Mark, everyone knew where they stood and everyone wanted to play for him, which I guess is, is what has resulted in Dorking being the success story there. Yeah, I mean, in, in that period that you were the, uh, the club, I think it was between 2016 and 2018 at West Humble. You know, I'm sure there was a, uh, you know, uh, loads of funny moments uh, during your time there. But is, is there any key ones that stand out? Very funny moments at, at the club. <laughs> the first one that comes to memory was um, we were playing Guernsey away um, on Easter Monday. I think it was the penultimate game of the promotion-winning season from the Isthmian Division One. And um, we'd been over there for a couple of nights and on the Monday morning, everyone was uh, like in their tracksuits, um, like club tracksuits, tucking into breakfast and somebody sort of gone, oh, where's, uh, where's Tony, Tony Prime? And uh, we've sort of looked out the window um, and across the, the courtyard is, is Tony's balcony. And he's out there in just a pair of like Y fronts, just getting a bit of the morning sun. And uh, he just... Got the nickname Tenerife Tony after that. 
Yeah, and, and still here to this day as well, as well, you know, <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and I mean, there was, you know, uh, that's the key one, was, was there any others you think that were, you know, I'm sure there was, you know, there, there were so many from down the days of West Humble, you know, building that community club um, with the players as well, was, was there any of the players that you thought were, were a good laugh at the change room? Uh, I guess the, the change room jokers were Anthony Oaks, Oaksy. A um, bit of a dorking legend as well, and then Giuseppe Sol. Uh, yeah. Those two were the main ones, really. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, switch off for one second in training, otherwise one of them would be putting the ball through your legs and shouting, running off, laughing, shouting Deli Alley. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was always good fun down at Wondrous. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, we talked about the players. We talked about um, uh, you know, manager Mark and chairman Mark. Um, but what were the fans like to you during that time when you were at the club? Yeah, great. Um, they're quite a unique bunch of, of fans, I think, um, Dorking Wonders fans. Someone that I haven't really experienced anywhere else in non-league. And I think that's maybe because they're such a new side and, and everyone there's probably had a, a, a side they supported in the past and whether they've become disillusioned with Premier League or Football League um, clubs or whether they've just thought, wow, Dorking, this looks like a, a team on the up, I want to get involved in this. Um, so there aren't any sort of old fans who have been through the ups and the downs, and you see it a lot in non-league football where um, non-league fans have been through years of pain, basically, and they sort of take it out on the players in a way, just they'll always seem a bit grumpy, but... You never really got that at Dorking. Everyone is just full of positivity. Um, fans are always great to me. Um, and I guess it helps that Dorking are always at the top end of the table. Um, so there's, there's not too much to, to have a moan about. Have, have you been down to Meadowbank for a game, obviously, you know, uh, since, um, since we moved into Meadowbank? Because I, I, like you said about positivity. I mean, that's definitely the one thing I think that stands out for, for me um, when, when talking to the fans. Yeah, I haven't actually made it down for a, uh, for a league game or anything like that. I was down for the, uh, the charity game last summer, um, yeah. which was my first glimpse of, of West Humble. Uh, not West Humble, sorry, Meadowbank. Um, yeah. Meadowbank, which obviously was, was meant to be built a year prior to that. And I remember in my final year, them say, right, the first game is Billericay in November and everyone getting excited for it. And then it was like, right, the first game is Leatherhead in February and getting excited about it. And then it ended up getting pushed back yeah, until yeah, the following yeah. season. So personally, I was gutted never to actually get to play there, but it's definitely on my uh, to-do list to get down and, um, and watch a game. I was hoping for a little playoff, uh, playoff game to get down to. Yeah, no, you know, <laughs> exactly. Um, no, exactly. So, so, I mean, during your time at the club, you, you scored lots of goals. And I was speaking to people before this. They said, oh, yeah, the, this goal I remember him for. The, I think, was it the hat trick v lowest off right at the end but for the last game, what was it? Or the, um, uh, uh, a brace, it was. It was brace, the last game at West Humble, wasn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and then, then people said, you know, uh, so many people say so many different goals. But, um, but what for you were the, you know, the, the real uh, standout ones? Um... As a team and a club, the, 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 go, the game and goal that sticks out to me is that playoff semi-final where um, Giuseppe's smashed it from about 25 yards down on the underside of the bar and Mac is headed at home to take the game to penalties. So as a team and being involved in it, that is the, that's one that sticks out. But for me personally, Lowest off's up there, knowing that I scored the last ever goal at West Humble. Um, but I guess most people remember the, the last minute header against um, Brightling Sea Regent, um, where we won 3 2. Uh, cue uh, a knee slide into the corner and a big bundle. Um, <laughs> and the thing is, I think there was only about 10 games left of the season, and we were down in sort of lower of mid table. Uh, just shows you what kind of club it is, really, when everyone gets so excited about a goal like that. Yeah, exactly. And and with all those memories, in 2018, you know, you departed the club. I mean, was that a very emotional time on that, that last game, v, v. Lois off especially? It was, yeah. Um, I think I knew that lower soft game was going to be my last um, game for the club. Uh, it's always such a shame. I feel like you'll struggle to find anyone that um, that's left talking that... 
like has it has anything bad to say about the club really um for me personally it was just the the right time i think i knew jason Pryor was coming in um so i knew that my game time would have been limited um and i had an offer from hamwell town who is five minutes down the road from me rather than an hour and a half probably from dorking um so everything sort of came together and it was the right time for me to leave i think but but yeah it was a sad time and uh Nothing but fond memories, really, of my time at Dorking. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see a lot of the, you know, all the time, you know, on, on our social media. You're still following the club, you know, Twitter, Instagram, stuff like that. How have you seen it change, just from a from from an outside perspective in in recent years? Um, well, just the stature of the club is just ridiculous. From when I was joining and would play sort of teams like South Park at home. Uh, last season going to Stockport County away and winning 4-0 and it's just on another level really now and um, and yeah like the work that you're doing with the social side is is amazing really it looks so professional and uh, it's just incredible really the, the the little club it felt like that I was going to in 2016 with big ambitions um, to the club it is now even just four years later the the shift is huge, really, and um, uh, it's credit to uh, yourself, to Mark White, uh, to everyone, really, that's got something to do with the club, because I, I don't know where they're going to stop, to be honest. Yeah, it, it must, you must be very proud to feel that, you know, you, you made a big mark there, and you were a big part of the, um, of the club's history. Absolutely, yeah, and if um, sort of Daw can get a big run in the FA Cup, or make it to the Football League or something like that, it'll, it'll be nice to look back on my career and, and think that I had even a small part to play in Dorking getting to, to where they are, even where they are today is, is incredible from where they've come from. Yeah, you, you can say I was there on that cold Tuesday night away at South Park <laughs> when they're playing the play Man United still. <laughs> um, I mean, this is a very open question. Like, what, what makes, in your opinion, what makes Dorking one of such a special club compared to other clubs around, around the world and around the country? I think it's just an appreciation of, of where the club has come from. Um, there's a lot of clubs in non-league um, that maybe what once were big clubs and there's a lot of... <sighs> that they feel like they deserve to, to be at a higher level than they are, really. And as you, as you know, in football, you deserve to be at whatever level you are, really. Football's a league season is as, as fair as it can be. Um, so I think the main thing that Dorking have done well is just keep their roots. And the fact that people like Les and Mark and Jez and everyone's still at the club and have been for years, I remember Les telling me he started off as a cleaner at West Humble during the off-season. And now, obviously, he's got such a big part to play at the club. It's just a really nice feeling that the club keep everyone um, together. And it feels like if Dorkin made it into the Football League, you'd still have Les on the um, tannoy and like, Mooney in the kitchen. Like, it just feels like such a nice, yeah. a nice community club, really, where everyone's appreciated. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, I mean, you, you know, you've seen how the club has changed in your, your time there, 2016, 2018, and since 2018 until now, you've seen it change. I think it's always been the story for Dorking Wanderers. It's constantly changing and building itself up. I mean, you know, what, what do you think the future holds for Dorking Wanderers? You know, where, where can you, it's a hard, hard one. You can't really predict it, can you? I'd be interested to hear what Mark thinks uh, or where Mark thinks it's going, but. I can't see Dorking staying at this level for much longer, really. If you look at their history, they're just reeks of success and doesn't really stand still. Like we talk about having to do up West Humble and then move to Meadowbank and now having to put a new stand into Meadowbank. The whole reason Dorking have got to do that is because they're so successful and every couple of years they are moving up to another level. Um, so... I don't know. The sky's the limit, I guess. Um, I honestly think at some point Dorking will be in the Football League and what a ridiculous and incredible story that would be. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, thanks for your time, Gareth. No, we do appreciate it and uh, um, I'm looking forward to uh, 
to hopefully seeing you down at Meadowbank very soon and uh, when we have a nice FA Cup game, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, no, of course, I really do. Okay. Appreciate it.